Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Johnson. I am the Executive Director for the Center of Ethics and Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania, or also known as Searle. And uh, I thank you for uh, coming out for this uh, momentous occasion while we release this uh, critically important report about closing Guantanamo Bay and recommendations thereof how to do so. And uh, I want to keep things moving tonight. So uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the uh, chairman of our executive board. Um, Dr. Uh, Morton Halperin is a uh, legend in the town of Washington. He has uh, served uh, multiple administrations through the years, had high level positions at uh, the State Department um, in various administrations, um, at the ACLU and academia. And uh, without any further ado, uh, here's Dr. Halpern. Thank you. I am honored to <clears throat> speak at this event launching a very important report by a distinguished and expert group of private citizens. The report, Beyond Guantanamo, calls for the long overdue closing of the U.S. Detention Center at the Guantanamo Naval Base, which, as you all know, since 2002, has held persons apprehended during the government's so-called War on Terror, which started at 9-11. <clears throat> and the report details the steps that can and must be taken to bring about the closing of this detention center. I want to start by saying that I fully endorse each of the report's very important, well-argued, and well-presented recommendations. I want to comment briefly on one issue that is in the report, namely torture. As the report makes clear, it will not be possible to close the Guantanamo Base detention facility without confronting the fact that many of those who are being held there were tortured not by rogue actors, but pursuant to the official policy of the United States government. It is equally true that the United States cannot move beyond its record of torture without closing the Guantanamo detention facility. However, there is much more we must do to address our responsibility for torture. First, the President of the United States needs to acknowledge officially and formally that the United States, as a matter of policy, inflicted torture and other cruel and degrading treatments on prisoners suspected of being terrorists at Guantanamo and other sites. And we can do this without breaking our commitment to our allies not to reveal those who gave us bases to conduct the torture operations. Second, the President should apologize on behalf of the nation for this shameful conduct and commit the United States never to engage in such conduct again. Third, the commitment must be fully and clearly enshrined in our laws in ways that bars torture and cruel and unusual punishment and makes such behavior a clear violation of federal criminal laws in all circumstances. We must also face the fact that the United States tortured actual human beings, some of which we are still some of whom we are still detaining, and that we owe each individual an explicit personal expression of regret. The government should move, remove the threat of the death penalty for those cases in which it is seeking to convict and punish suspected terrorists who were tortured. In offering plea bargains, we should reduce our, the, the, its demands where the subject was tortured. Finally, I believe that the President of the United States should appoint a nonpartisan commission to provide at long last a definitive report to the nation of how we came to violate the cherished principles for which this nation stands by taking the decision to use torture as an instrument of policy. When we have that report, it will be hope appropriate for the nation to consider appropriate measures of ac individual accountability. To end where I began, torture and Guantanamo are inextricably intertwined. I am proud that Cyril is addressing the complexities of this subject and its moral urgencies in this excellent report, and I look forward to joining in the debate. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Claire Finkelstein, who is the faculty director of the center and the co-chair of the working group that produced this impressive report. Thank you.
thank you so much, Mort, and I'm very, very pleased to have uh, Mort as the chair of our executive board, uh, and this is his first appearance, uh, first official appearance <coughs> as Searle's executive board chair, so thank you so much, uh, Mort. Um, so as, as Mort said, um, I am the faculty director of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law and a law professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, work on Guantanamo, on torture, uh, on indefinite detention, and all of the issues that the report deals with has been really the lifeblood of the center. Uh, the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law is a center that I founded uh, just over 10 years ago now to address rule of law questions that arise in transnational conflict and, uh, and uh, the rule of law in uh, domestic uh, politics as well, uh, where um, democratic governance is concerned. Uh, we have addressed uh, the issue of torture, targeted killing, uh, domestic violent extremism and all, all sorts of issues uh, that have challenged uh, the country in the past many years, but none has been as much the focus of the work of the center uh, as Guantanamo and uh, the use of torture. Uh, I'm delighted to have led with my partner, uh, co-convener Harvey Rishikoff, this august working group uh, with numerous high-level professionals in national security uh, and uh, an interdisciplinary group uh, deeply committed to the rule of law that spans the political spectrum, uh, spans the disciplinary spectrum. We've had both former uh, defense lawyers and former prosecutors from Guantanamo. Uh, we have doctors and lawyers, of course, and uh, in a way, the mainstay of the group was the summer interns that have worked with Searle. Uh, Searle has held a summer intern program now for a number of years, and we have started to investigate and bite off major projects during the summer internship. So this report began as a summer internship project. We were very honored to have a number of professionals gather to help guide the students in their research uh, and uh, to, to work with us. And the project, of course, grew and grew and was an extremely complex one, uh, taking uh, about uh, 15 months to complete. Uh, we're extremely grateful for the partnership of the Annenberg Public Policy Center and Kathleen Hall Jamison for supporting our efforts, for supporting the summer internship, and for co-sponsoring the report uh, that you see before you today. I want to give a special uh, shout out and thanks to uh, Ilya Rudiak, who is our senior fellow. Ilya, could you stand up? Who has worked incredibly hard to help bring this report about. To Mark Fallon, who was our interim executive director during the majority of the period in which we were working on this report. Thank you, Mark. And to Jen Cohen, our director of engagement. Jen, are you here? Can you? There she is. Thank you, Jen, for everything you've done uh, and will continue to do to publicize the report. And of course, to the members of the working group. Um, I'll introduce our panelists in just a moment, but before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge members of the working group who are here with us today in the audience. Uh, Greg Block uh, from Georgetown, very important. Thank you, Greg, for being involved in this. Uh, Stuart Gerson is here, former acting attorney general. Maria Hartwig, are you here? No, no who's not here. Uh, Gail Help who is here, who is uh, formerly of the CIA. Uh, Alka, I don't know if Alka is here. There, Alka Pradon, uh, who has been very involved in Guantanamo and also teaches at Penn. Uh, and Steve Zanakis, uh, very involved as well. Uh, and then we have one representative from the summer intern class that worked on the report, and that is Luke Elegant. Luke, if you can stand up. Thank you very much. Let me now introduce our panelists for today. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have here uh, Colleen Kelly, who was the co-founder of September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrow uh, and who um, uh, tragically lost her brother on 9-11. Thank you, Colleen, for joining us today. 
Uh, and then uh, we have uh, Alberto Mora uh, to my right, who is uh, a contributing author of the working group and a member of the uh, Searle uh, Executive Board. He's the immediate past director of the American Bar Association Global Rule of Law Initiative and former general counsel of the Department of the Navy. Thank you for joining us, Alberto. Uh, Harvey Rishikoff, of course, who is my co-chair, is the former convening authority for the Guantanamo Military Commissions, as well as a visiting professor at Temple Law School and a Searle Executive Board member. Uh, General John Altenberg, who is a contributing author of the working group as well, is former acting judge advocate general for the U.S. Army, uh, first president and convening authority for the Guantanamo Military Commissions, uh, and of course Mark Fallon, uh, who is a former Naval Criminal Investigative Service Deputy Assistant and Director and Chief Investigator for the Guantanamo Military Commissions and a Searle Advisory Council member. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Well, um, this enormous project of this report covered a number of different areas, and, and I suggest that we um, have a generalized discussion about some of the key points in the report. And, and what I'd like to do is actually uh, draw to your attention several of the recommendations. We first put out our series of 13 recommendations uh, publicly before we issued the full report. Uh, and several of them, I think, really um, bear emphasis in the context of this panel. Uh, so one of the first things that we recommend most urgently uh, is that President Biden should rescind his executive order 13823 and make closing Guantanamo Bay detention facility a national priority. And while the administration may say there are many things standing in the way of uh, closing Guantanamo Bay, not least of all the fact that the NDAA forbids the transfer of uh, funds from Guantanamo Bay to uh, the federal uh, prison system and court system. Nevertheless, uh, we call on the administration to make closing Guantanamo Bay uh, an absolute clear and public goal, uh, and uh, as we say, to rescind the order um, uh, creating Guantanamo prison facility. And I'd like to call on some of my uh, fellow panelists to discuss the importance of closing Guantanamo. Um, Mort Halpern talked about partly the symbolism, what it means to continue to have Guantanamo open. Uh, when we think about uh, the 21 years that have elapsed since 9-11, and the fact that the majority of today's college population was either not born on 9-11 or, or is, was too young to remember the attacks, yet this generation has lived with the existence of Guantanamo Bay, the knowledge of uh, torture, and the um, uh, embarrassing and shameful history uh, regarding rule of law violations and, uh, and continuing uh, mistreatment by indefinite detention, and the fact that the majority of detainees in Guantanamo are there without ever having been charged with a crime. Uh, what would the importance of Guantanamo be with respect to restoring the law of, law of, of uh, the rule of law and starting to put closure on the uh, war on terror and of this uh, terrible history. Uh, maybe, um, Alberto, you could talk a little bit about that uh, since you have seen it and been there from the, from the very beginning, uh, from the inside. Um, thanks, Claire. Um, uh, law is important because it defines the, the quality of justice that, that our nation provides to, to our own citizens and residents. But law, law is also important because it helps define the world in which we would want to live in. Um, the United States made various serious legal mistakes uh, in, in the war on terror that are both domestic and international in, in, in nature. Domestically, we violated our own laws, uh, in, certainly in the, in the application of cruel treatment to, uh, to prisoners of war at the time, but also because we damaged the fabric of international law uh, by, by doing so. Guantanamo represents a continuing violation of the norms of international law, particularly in the uh, degree of due process that is that is allocated to to these uh, detainees. 
Russia's invasion of Ukraine reminds us why international law is so important, and it reminds us why American leadership in helping create and maintain an ever more, more robust international legal structure is important as well. The United States cannot exercise credible leadership in helping uh, uh, create the system that will account for Russian atrocities, including the, the crime of aggression, unless we're also able to, to look backwards at, at actually in the current uh, time and, and, and clean up some of the mistakes that we committed in, in Guantanamo. These are, these are the reasons why it's important. Um, uh, as the United States plays an important role with the rest of the international community in determining how we are going to account for Russian acts of aggression, we need to remind ourselves that we have to apply to ourselves the same standard that we would apply to others. Um, we do this because it's who we wish to be, but also because we, it's the, the kind of world that we would wish to create. So um, I, I endorse the, the findings of the study. I commend the, the, the study and its conclusions and recommendations to you and, and um, urge you again to, to remember what an important issue this is 22 years after 9-11 uh, 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 yesterday. So again, thank you, Claire. And uh, one of the most concerning aspects with regard to the rule of law has to do with the commissions and what is widely perceived as a failure of the commissions. And we have here two convening authorities um, and I would ask uh, General Altenberg first to speak about the, um, the failure of the commission system and the, um, the hopes that we might have had that things would go different, differently and what should be done now with regard to the commissions. Uh, tough for me to talk about what should happen now. I, 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 can, I can address what I found in 2004 when I embarked on this uh, and was... Uh, displeased with, with how they had been formulated by the Department of Defense. Uh, in short, uh, my view then was that they should have uh, made one of the, one of the departments uh, an executive agent uh, to, to take care of, the, of this issue and if they wanted to have commissions and then let the executive agent probably should have been the Army because the Army has the most military justice experience and, and deals with the largest population and they had considerable experience historically in doing commissions, going all the way back to the, you might say, 18th century, really, <laughs> with, uh, with the, with the uh, British spy case, uh, but certainly in the Mexican War and, uh, and the Civil War and World War II especially, uh, there were some 800 commissions in the European theater alone in the wake of World War II. So th there was experience and there was some knowledge of how to do that. Unfortunately, when they changed from the Articles of War and the Articles for the Government of the Navy in the, in the late 40s and came up with the Uniform Code of Military Justice, they didn't really address uh, military commissions. Uh, they addressed uh, some of the other tribunals that are in, the, uh, in those codes, uh, but they didn't do much. They left, there's I think six or seven articles in the UCMJ that actually mentioned military commissions. And they didn't, they didn't do a very good job of going after that. Um, quite frankly, um, our office in, uh, in between 2004 and 2006 attempted to do that, and it's, it's, it, it's a model, I think, for what the Department of Defense should have done, which was to take the manual for, military, manual for courts martial, uh, paragraph by paragraph, on the left, let's just say, to make it easy and a, and a visual example, and take the first paragraph. Would that work for commissions? It would. Bring it over. And until you find a paragraph that, well, that really wouldn't work for commissions for war criminals in the context of the whatever year we were in. So we need to modify that. And so we'll put that over here in military commissions and we'll modify that and we'll explain it. There will be an analysis and an explanation. And they would have ended up with a, a similar, similar to the manual for courts martial, but with some exceptions, but they would have been fully explained and analyzed and it could have been the manual for military commissions. And that's what that's what we thought should have happened. Um, policymakers got in the way of all of that. Uh, I, I I couldn't explain. Uh, I can't explain. Somebody would ask me, why are we doing this right away? We we didn't do commissions in Europe until 1947, 48. Why are we doing this right now? I asked that question. Uh, that that I never. There was never an answer to that question. I mean, it was, I think, uh, political public relations, 
Uh, somebody wanted to make an announcement. This seemed like a good thing to say. Uh, they rushed into it. I think we all know from what happened in November of 2001, the way that first announcement came out, and then they had to backtrack and do something with the DOD regulations. I mean, uh, some very bright lawyer probably thought, well, you know, President Roosevelt's executive order establishing the military commissions for the eight Nazi saboteurs withstood a Supreme Court review, eight to zero, uh, without getting into the details of what that was like that summer and everything else, but eight to zero, and they upheld his, his order. So let's just do that. And so they published an order that they took the name Roosevelt out and put the name Bush in and, and other <laughs> things like that. But there really weren't too many differences and because it had, it had been to the Supreme Court. And that, that failed to, to uh, take into account the fact that Roosevelt's 1942 military commission order was based on the 1920 Articles of War that there had been a 1948 Articles of War after the war, and then the UCMJ in 1950, subsequently amended in 1968 dramatically, and then again in 1983 uh, dramatically. Uh, not to say that the entire practice of military justice across the services between 19, I think, 75 and where we were then in 2003, 2004 was also dramatic. And, and they didn't know account for any of that. They came back with a 1942 order that worked because it was based on the 1920 Articles of War. Well, Articles of War, excuse me. And so I think you know we were off on the wrong foot from the get-go. So, so from the standpoint of achieving justice for the families of the victims, uh, as well as achieving justice uh, and uh, fair trials uh, for detainees, Harvey, uh, the commissions have been an utter failure. There have been no trials yet that have uh, even begun, let alone come to conclusion. There have been no uh, no convictions except one, um, depending on how you count, to guilty pleas. Can you talk to us a little bit about the reason for these uh, this failure and why there has not been closure through the commission system? So thank you, Claire. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, there are some members of the task force that are here. I've introduced them. Yeah, and they, uh, we had about 40 plus individuals who worked on this report. Uh, from the left to the right, we had uh, people who were doctors, psychologists, attorneys, but it was really a cross-disciplinary effort. And what's intriguing is this group all agreed on the 13 recommendations that Claire outlined, which demonstrated a certain consensus both on the left and right, about the process of the military commissions. And the first is, um, I only took the job uh, because I believe deeply in the need of closure for the families. That uh, a major principle that dating back to the Magna Carta is that justice, justice delayed is justice denied. And I think we should never lose focus of the families and the families and what they live through and how this continues now 20 plus years later. That in and of itself is an indictment of the process. Uh, the second part of the issue is, as John articulated, right from the inception of the commissions, they had failed to understand the developments that had subsequent had taken place and unfortunately, I actually, as one of my students who helped draft the original statement, which was exactly the statement made by FDR, which the case that John was referring to is In re Curin. And the other aspect of In re Curin, from the court's perspective, it was considered one of the mistakes of the court because they actually issued the order which resulted in the uh, hanging of a number of the In re Curin defendants, but they did not issue an opinion to support the order. And then when they had to figure out to write the opinion to support the order, they couldn't get consensus on what theory of law the court could agree on. And it was uh, an extraordinarily awkward situation that the court had published it but couldn't explain its reasoning. And the justices argued over the summer, 
and only a few of the justices said, look, we got to have a consensus when we come back before the next term, or else this is going to be a stain on the court that we don't understand what the reasoning was. So that's the inception. The second issue that you've raised, Claire, is um, why has it been so difficult to have the proceedings go forward? And there, I would say to you, which is reflected in the report, um, this will be the first time that if the trials go forward and there is a consensus or a verdict that the entire evidence will be all on classified information in which the defense attorneys have not seen the underlying evidence. They've only seen summaries of the evidence, which will result in a clear grounds for appeal. So that becomes quite problematic. The second part is um, the entire proceedings are enshrouded under a classified set of orders that started the program. So because of the intense classification, um, there was no way for this to be open. And if any of you who may have down, been down to Guantanamo, there has to be a delay in the proceedings in the event someone somehow says something that may be of a classified nature that has not been cleared. Again, unprecedented for us to have a situation like this. And then thirdly, um, the issue that I think we have to, is in the report tangentially, is this issue of the aging population of the detainees and the fact that we've reached with the number of my, the medical participants, like the, the general and Reg, who have articulated that if we do not provide the appropriate medical attention to these individuals under the Geneva Conventions, we'll be in violation of the conventions where you're supposed to provide people under your custody similar medical services that you give to your own people. This is a, now why that's of concern, because under the theory of reciprocity, as was mentioned uh, by our friend Mora about Ukraine, the Russians will say, well, wait a second. You, we have captured people, but there's no obligation for us to have to demonstrate due care under the Geneva Conventions because you in America seem not to be following that. So why should we follow if you allegedly one of the great nations of rule of law are not discharging your duty? So that's why this has become problematic. And I think across the board, it's a clear indication the commissions have not performed their primary function, which is to quickly go to trial, come back with a verdict, and move on. This is not what has happened. And once you move the capital cases and the capital counts, is why we are strongly encouraging that there should be some plea bargaining in order mm -hmm. to go forward in order to have this resolved. And this is all ultimately, yes, there's international law considerations. There are all the other considerations of a rule of law. But in the, in the end, for me, it's do we give the families closure or not? Yeah. This is just unacceptable for Americans and American justice to have left these individuals with no sense of closure. So in that connection, I'd like to invite uh, Colleen Kelly to speak a little bit about that and the uh, importance of closure uh, for the families, but also more specifically, the second recommendation of the report uh, is exactly as Harvey said, which is that we very much support uh, resolving as many of these cases as possible by guilty plea. Um, and, and we have also recommended that the Department of Defense should take the death penalty off the table for defendants willing to plead guilty. Uh, is that likely to be received by the families of the victims as being soft on terrorism? And, and what is the, um, what is the uh, importance of closure from your standpoint? Well, first I would say, thanks, Claire, but first I would say there is no consensus among 3,000 family members. So you have people in the thousands. It's a broad spectrum. Um, but there's something that I heard one of the defense attorneys at Guantanamo say, Jay Cannell, that I think is really helpful. It would help to me. And he said both things are true. 
It is true that 2,977 people died on September 11th. It is also true that men were tortured when they were captured and held in detention. Those two truths are why Guantanamo exists to this day. Both things are true. So I, I don't speak for all the families. I do speak for my organization, September 11th Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. Um, we do hold NGO observer status at Guantanamo, so we are there for each hearing. We also have been there as family members as well. And so um, I value hearing much of the history, and I value these recommendations because here are people who are integrally involved in all things Guantanamo for the past 21 years. And you're right, 21 years is too long. I look at terror attacks around the world, Bali, um, India, Madrid, the UK, more recently in Belgium and in the Bataclan um, in Paris. Those trials have happened. Those sentences have happened. Those people have been held accountable. There has been no accountability for what happened on September 11th. A trial, I mean, maybe you can count Massawi, but a trial has not happened for a crime that was committed 21 years ago. So our group is looking for judicial finality. I'm looking for judicial finality. I think I'm not a lawyer, we are not lawyers, but having observed the commission hearings for, for 10 years now, more than 10 years now, we started advocating for plea deals back in 2017 because it seemed like there was no other way out because those two things are true. People were killed and torture happened. So we strongly endorse the recommendation about plea deals. Um, thank you for everyone here for their hard work on the recommendations. Anything that chips away at the foundational structure at the commissions, uh, I'm very, very grateful for. So Mark, let me, let me ask you now. Um, so the picture that we paint uh, in the report is that not only is there a moral obligation to close Guantanamo, and not only is there a powerful efficiency argument for closing Guantanamo, which costs upwards of $540 million a year to uh, sustain the incarceration of 36 detainees. Um, but um, that it is absolutely possible to close Guantanamo and to, um, and, to, and to either have cases plead out or to bring detainees into a federal court or into the courts martial system. And um, although you're not a lawyer, you have seen these cases uh, up close and you were there uh, when the first detainees arrived in Guantanamo. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you see those alternative modes of, of justice and what you think it would accomplish for the system? Yeah, I, I sure will. And Guantanamo uh, is an opportunity lost, right? It was a concept that was come up with in, in 2001 um, and, and we kind of lost our way uh, as a nation uh, in that regard. Uh, at Guantanamo, justice has not only been delayed and denied, justice has been deceived. I mean, deceived with this cloak of invisibility that the government has placed over anything involving this family of interrogational abuses, including torture, and, and, and adopting cruelty as policy, as national policy. Uh, and, and, and I saw this go off the rails uh, in October 2002. Uh, and and, and you, you, we have to look backwards to look forward. And, and, I, and I just want to read a couple of quotes from what I, what I annotated uh, after a CIA uh, attorney, the chief counsel for the Counterterrorism Center, came to Guantanamo and, and actually helped facilitate the migration of what later became the EIT program from the CIA to the Department of Defense. Uh, and, and I wrote a memo that this looks like the kinds of stuff congressional hearings are made of. Statements were recorded from the meeting that said, it is basically subject to, 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 to perception. If a detainee dies, you're doing it wrong. Any of the techniques that lie on the harshest end of the spectrum 
must be performed by a highly trained individual. Medical personnel should be present to treat any possible accidents. I wrote, this seems to stretch beyond the bounds of legal propriety. Uh, I wrote and sent up and down the chain of command, talk of the wet towel treatment, which results in the lymphatic gland reacting as if you're suffocating, would in my opinion shock the conscience of any legal body looking at the results of the interrogations or possibly even the interrogators. Somebody needs to be look, considering how history will look back at this. Those words are as true today as they were then. And, and, and the problem with this process, trying to seek justice, is the fact that while President Obama said we tortured some folks, we still try to hide how they were tortured and by whose hand they were tortured. Uh, and you cannot claim that you have justice for some detainees at Guantanamo while some remain in indefinite detention without trial. As a nation that, that believes in the rule of law, we can have people like Majid Khan, who has pleaded guilty, cooperated with the government, remain at Guantanamo Bay after his sentence has been uh, expired. Uh, we cannot have other prisoners there. Uh, Abu Zubaydah has never been charged with a crime, was not a member of Al Qaeda, yet he remains at Guantanamo in this indefinite detention without trial. As a nation, how do we reconcile that when we look at Ukraine, when we're looking at war crime trials there, and they're looking at Guantanamo as an example of what not to do in their country as they are trying to, to make sure that they fight the Russians without employing the same tactics that the Russians utilize. Now, now let's, thank you, Mark, for, for that. And now let's talk about a number of detainees have been cleared for transfer, yet they sit there indefinitely waiting for transfers, and there doesn't seem to be, from what we can tell, any progress towards actual transfer. One of the things, uh, and we highlight this in the report, is that the Office of the Special Envoy for Guantanamo closure uh, was closed within the Department of State, and we call on the State Department to uh, reopen that office and to work extensively on, uh, on transferring detainees who have been cleared for transfer to other countries. Um, maybe, Harvey, you want to talk a little yes. bit about the restoration of that office. So I'd li we'd like to commend, I, I would like to commend the Biden administration because they have reopened that uh, office, that they are trying to figure out what they can do in order to do the repatriation. And also, they, uh, the Biden administration have, has, uh, has a new prosecutor, a new defense counsel, the new prosecutor new, has removed his, the motion that they had in order to use the evidence that had been derived from the, quote, enhanced interrogation techniques, which were violations of the law of armed conflict, which was where we had consensus among the group of the violations that took place, that there's no defense of those. Uh, the issue of the torture issue always became a legal problem because of memos that were written by the Office of General Counsel, uh, oh, well, Office of Legal Counsel, and that this became problematic for lawyers inside the system advising operators, even though there is a recognition that that was, again, violation of the law of armed conflict that we understand it to be. So this issue is the Biden administration has stepped back from the use of those any evidence from that because the position that the government had taken was that they could have uh, new clean teams come in, just talk to the defendants, and then use that evidence. And the position that um, I think many people take in the law is that the original problem of the way that information was derived now taints the entire process. And so that becomes problematic is if you continue to have a tainted process, as a number of the panelists said, it delays the capability for you to go forward. And what, remember, each one of these cases will be appealed. And when the appellate courts review it at the federal level, uh, they will, the commissions have not done well in the federal courts at the appellate level and because of the variety of these issues and violations. So as you say, the Biden administration has seen the need to do that. They've seen the need to read it, figure out how to do what the people have been available to be repatriated. But the other element is, are you going to send these people back to Afghanistan? 
Is that going to be a safe place for individuals to go? Do you want to, uh, or do we have other responsibilities to make sure that they will not continue aid it, be going, go forward with their intents? So this is why it's become problematic, but we're encouraged that the recommendation that we had and circulated has been apparently adopted by the administration and that we would like to see other parts of our recommendations similarly adopted by the administration. So one of the things that we call for, Harvey, um, is, uh, of course, the uh, a prohibition, and we ask that Congress address this, on the use of any evidence derived from any illegal activity, including torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment, or the use of interrogation practices prohibited by U.S. law. Uh, and, and one has to think uh, in a very, in a very fine-grained way about this, because of course there was an effort to send in clean teams to try to derive the same evidence uh, without torture that was originally derived under torture. Uh, and we take the position in the report that clean team evidence is tainted evidence uh, that is a violation of due process. Uh, I wonder, Alberto, if you could talk a little bit about the due process issues and why it's so important to follow the same due process practices in the military commissions uh, if the commissions were to have a fair, law-abiding, rule-of-law governed uh, processes uh, that we have in federal court. Two aspects come to mind immediately. There are a number of things that could be said about this, but one of them is that uh, for capital defendants in, in a domestic uh, litigation, in fact, almost anywhere in the world, they're entitled to the maximum discovery possible about exculpatory um, or mitigation uh, matters. So in, in an ordinary American court, capital defendants who were tortured would have absolute right uh, to every bit of evidence dealing with the mistreatment that they received. That's not happening uh, to uh, to these defendants or to their lawyers, which is a glaring uh, due process violation for starters. But there's another uh, also um, uh, due process violation that shocks the conscience, which is the denial of medical information to these individuals. I mean, information on how they were treated is absolutely relevant to the treatment for the medical conditions and psychiatric or psychological conditions which they've they've suffered as a result of the torture. That information is not also not made available to uh, the medical professionals who would be treating, are treating these individuals for the damages they suffered. Those are two due process and uh, violations of fundamental rights that these defendants have, which continue to this day. So uh, we want to make sure that we leave time for audience comments and questions, but I want to highlight one, one final aspect here, and I have not read all the 13 recommendations that we have, but two of the recommendations I think we could group together. Uh, one is around classification, uh, which Harvey mentioned briefly, and uh, one of the uh, very serious impediments uh, to achieving justice through the commission system has been the extreme classification in which the government has literally impeded its own prosecutions uh, by uh, having such extensive classification. Um, and, and the other is the use of the state secrets privilege, uh, which we saw very prominently in the Abu Zubaydah case. Um, and Mark and I each, in fact, wrote about the state secrets doctrine. Mark, I wonder if you could just uh, talk for a minute about the extreme secrecy around the use of torture, the extreme secrecy around everything having to do with Guantanamo continuing to this day, uh, and how that has, in some sense, uh, really interfered both with the defense and the prosecution from moving forward and reaching closure on these cases. Yeah, the, 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 the fact that any information is so classified and redacted makes it impossible for a defense counsel or a prosecutor to legitimately put on a case when there is information that is withheld from them. Uh, and, and so this special access program that no one was ever supposed to find out about uh, and, and that became just widespread through the government, it became standard operating procedure within the Department of Defense to utilize these some same practices that were used at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, uh, and, and, and we saw the proliferation of violent extremism based on those things. And, and, and so right now, today, there's hearings or there's people at Guantanamo, uh, and Harvey had mentioned that there is, uh, there's delays in, in, in what's, transcript, or what's transcribed. Uh, actually, the, the transcripts, after it's been publicly released, 
have had redactions from information that's already been out there in the public domain. So let me, yeah, let me jump on this. Yep. So if you can imagine, there are two issues. One, as the convening authority, um, I requested the classification document that dictates how the classifications should be administered. And you would think as the convening authority, you would have every right to have that document. And the, um, the commander sent them over to me, and then was in, I got a call, was instructed that they had been sent over to me incorrectly, and that I, as the convening authority, should not have those documents to explain how they're getting classified, which to me was a bizarre set of circumstances, not my understanding of American justice. So the last recommendation I'd underscore before we move to questions is that the idea that we have requested the Senate Judiciary Committee and the House too to hold uh, and set up a commission to look at the concept of military commissions. As John pointed out, there's been a, a misunderstanding of the appropriate rules for the commissions. Uh, there have been a number of attempts to make the commissions comport more with federal criminal law. But at this point, there's been no real analysis or statement about what the future role of military commissions should be, what should be the left and right margins of military commissions. Mark is very involved in the adoption of the Mendez principles. There should be a clear statement about what America's understanding is and what is improper and what is allowed in the interrogation of individuals and what is not, which is outside the bounds. And until we have a clear statement from, I think, the United States and particularly the Congress, we will continue to be in this sort of gray area of a, a statement of what, how we're we going to proceed under the law of armed conflict as we have, if, if and when we have future commissions that will be constituted. So I, I just want to, um, uh, to close by, by mentioning our final uh, 13th recommendation it has to do with accountability. Um, we, uh, of course, all know that the Senate Armed Services Committee held hearings and issued a very important report. Uh, early on, and then there was the Senate Select Intelligence Committee report, which was thousands of pages, uh, that really uh, broke open the history of torture uh, for the country, though uh, uh, it is mostly still classified, but even the executive summary um, uh, did that uh, by itself. Um, but there was never a Judiciary Committee hearing. And uh, as an ethics center uh, that is run by lawyers and has uh, executive board members uh, who are mostly lawyers. We're very focused on the role of the legal profession, uh, the role of lawyers in guiding the country and in helping to provide the uh, guardrails on the rule of law in this country. I think it's critical for the country to have some uh, basic appreciation uh, of what happened here with the Office of Legal Counsel and the, uh, the legal blessing that was given for the use of torture in this context, uh, and, and for the country to do some soul searching and, and uh, the bar associations in conjunction with uh, the American Bar Association and, and other bar associations about uh, what should government lawyers be doing, uh, what should their relationship to policy be, uh, and how can they help support and enhance uh, due process in all of our proceedings, criminal proceedings, as well as uh, democratic governance. Uh, so let me close with that thought and invite first any members of the working group uh, who are in the audience who would like to speak to any aspect of the report. Stuart? We have a microphone right there. Stuart, you're standing right next to a microphone, and I'm sure you have Which things to say. Which we all know is a dangerous issue, Stuart. Okay. I'm the uh, token right winger on, on, on this operation. And uh, uh, I note that you should read carefully what the recommendations actually are, as opposed to some of the things that have been said uh, that ought to be done. Uh, and uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, uh, many of the arguments uh, that uh, are made for closure uh, uh, can be made logically and legally without respect to um, uh, describing where, where many of us uh, might have differences of, of opinion as to process, as to, as to enhanced interrogation, or, or, the, like, or the like of it. Uh, and to me, the fundamental nature of this, if I strip away 
like any, any emotion is that it's unimportant to me that uh, uh, individuals who are detained might or might not have due process rights. I focus in, in, instead on what it is that we ought to be doing as, as, as a nation, what's incumbent upon us, irrespective of what anybody might be entitled to or not entitled to. Uh, moreover, uh, I, I open and close with the uh, fundamental uh, principle uh, that for, for uh, process to be just, it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, and we lack a middle and an end for much of what we've heard about. And so uh, I have tended to focus upon that uh, and uh, urge you look at the actual recommendations, uh, virtually all of which have to do with that. Yeah, and thank you for that, Stuart, because um, I think a strength of the report is that we absolutely did have a wide variety of views uh, in the working group and that the language of the recommendations, the 13 recommendation, was agreed upon by all members uh, of the group. Uh, and, and we hope that that uh, paints a picture of how a bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, consensus could be reached in the country on this issue. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thanks, Clara. Uh, a couple of uh, hopefully quick observations. One on the clean team uh, uh, proposition. The psychologists who devised the so-called enhanced interrogation, AK torture program, uh, were clear about their own theoretical structure, which rebuts uh, the clean team notion. The psychologists Mitchell and Jessen and others. Uh, made the argument that they transformed over the longer term uh, the uh, thinking and the feeling of the people who they conducted their uh, uh, interrogation program upon. Uh, and if that's right, then the government's own proposition, uh, the government's own model, rebuts the notion that you can then go back even a few years after the fact and interview people with a so-called clean team and somehow get evidence that's untainted by uh, torture. Uh, the other uh, quick thought, the government makes the uh, argument that it is uh, providing adequate medical care for these aging, uh, increasingly ailing uh, uh, men. Um, but it, the government is not allowed by federal statute to bring uh, patients uh, to the U.S. So they've got to do things like set up emergency rooms, or, or rather uh, uh, surgical operating suites, bring in MRI machines and the like. Um, and it's utterly, it, it's sh shockingly costly to do that. Think of how much health care costs uh, in this country. We spend about $12,000 a person per year on health care. We're talking about numbers much higher. Uh, to, to do all this, and the quality is going to be a whole lot lower, and we're going to come into non-compliance with Geneva Convention and other obligations uh, for providing health care for these folks. And I, I make the prediction now that within the next, say, 15 years, there's going to be a malpractice-like scandal uh, arising from the abysmal health care that these folks uh, are getting at shocking cost. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, anyone else? Questions from the audience? The floor is open. Questions or comments? Please, Lisa. Thank you. Actually, mine perhaps follows on. Maybe you could just introduce oh, yourself my name is first. Lisa Hajar. I'm a professor of sociology at UCSB. New book coming out, The War in Court. Um, the, how the inside story of torture. But I wanted to follow up on the point, and it really clicked with me with something that I think um, Alberto had said about the secrecy. Um, you know, it's not just the medical treatment, but the psychological treatment. And I'm imagining that um, even now, the, the way I see it, and I've been a close observer, plea bargains are the only way out of this because the laws that were devised cannot withstand actual you know, appeals court cases. There is like the, the whole legal regimen of the charges that are ridiculous. So the plea bargains are the only means. And in order to have effective plea bargaining, it's not just taking the death penalty off the table, but having effective psychological treatment. And I'm wondering whether or not the imposed secrecy around the kind of treatment that people, um, the detainees, particularly the 9-11, the Al-Nashri and the others who are 
um, in the death penalty for former CIA prisoners if that's actually implicated in this question of treatment, secrecy, and out finality to what's going on with the plea bargains. Great. Does anyone want to respond to that? We should, we should invite our medical member of the team to speak. Sure. Steve Zanakis. Brigadier General. Thanks. Uh, I'm Steve Zanakis. I'm a psychiatrist, physician, Brigadier General. I've been to Guantanamo many, many times and seen the defendants. So let me try and answer your question, I think, Lisa, as you've presented it. But um, first, let me also, uh, as a state, that it, it is imperative and very important for us to get closure here for the families and for everybody that's been involved. And, and, and to some extent, in terms of the um, health and welfare of these individuals, uh, closure is important uh, as well. But the, um, it is if difficult, if not impossible, for us to provide what we would all consider reasonable standard of care and what would be, any of us would feel would be obligated uh, to provide if we are not able to have the access and disclosure to the information of what these, uh, what the experience was of these of these men, and in fact, currently, what their clinical uh, their symptoms are, and the impairments and the disabilities that they have, and that would, there is a an element of that, is that for that to occur, as we all know, in any time that we go see our physician or clinician, there needs to be some rapport and trust. And because of what's happened here, that is almost impossible. That having been experienced, having been subjected to uh, the torture that, they, that was inflicted on them by military people in uniform, it is nearly impossible for there to be the level of trust and confidence in the care that you would expect that as a clinician you would want to have with any patient. So that's going to have to come in a different format and in a different way. And we're going to have to, in order to meet our obligations, and, uh, and either internationally or our own ethical obligations, find a way to do that that is, is establishes the fundamental relationship between clinician and patient. Steve, thank you very much for that. that. One of the things that's very interesting is that the same difficulty that the medical profession has meeting its obligations to care for Guantanamo detainees, uh, the legal teams also have had. And of course, um, anyone familiar with this history is aware that General Baker, who is also a member of our executive board um, uh, and came on very recently, um, had to allow his entire legal team uh, for the uh, al-Nashiri case uh, to be dissolved because they could not meet the standard required of lawyers uh, in representing a client because they could not, among other things, could not have confidential conversations uh, with their client. So let, let, let me just set the record straight because I was a convening authority with uh, General Baker during that period. Uh, one of the issues which is folds into the problem set is that there was an analysis done of the allegations concerning the fact that there had been a quote a microphone inside the room dealing with the attorney and, and defendants meetings an investigation was conducted they then classified the investigation <laughs> I moved to have the investigation declassified, which in the end was rejected by the original classifier, as we call it, as you know. And the judge, again, and as part of the problem at Guantanamo, we've had revolving judges repeatedly in these cases. No one single judge has followed the case from beginning to end. And so despite my order to have it declassified, it was overruled. And that is why the Mr. Baker, General Baker, said, I'm not going to go forward. And don't forget, we also had Baker became a, defend, a, a witness in the case. He refused to take the stand in the case. 
This resulted in him being then reprimanded by the judge. I then placed him in um, confinement for two days. I then reviewed the record, released him, and s said that he should be uh, reviewed for his ethical obligations inside a courtroom, sent that on, and we are still quite friendly, the, uh, uh, John and I. And now you're uh, on the executive uh, board uh, together. And we <laughs> did it as a, so professional, I still contend my opinion. My, one of the district court judges, Judge Lamberth, who we all know, I think in an improper decision overruled me, and not, but nonetheless allowed the remedy to go forward that he should be um, dealt with by his JAG Corps at the Marine Corps, and that has never taken place. This is the weird things that took place as a result of the secrecy issue that enwraps the entire process. And also clear, uh, one of our recommendations, that in most military commissions, the convening authority is rather the authority. Right. That is not true in this military. There is no single authority in this process, which John laid out, which has contributed to the lack of holding anyone responsible, its side, DOD, for this process. Other questions from the audience? Or comments? Alka. I was construing silence as total agreement, so. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. oh, come on, you know me better than that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, my name is Alka Pradhan. I'm one of the defense attorneys uh, in the 9 11 case. I represent Omar Al Baluchi. Um, just thank you to everyone. Um, this was obviously a very long project, and I think um, there's a lot to be proud of. Um, you know, we talked a lot about, we've gotten a little bit in to the weeds of the issues at Guantanamo, I think rightfully so. There's a lot about classification and a lot about, um, you know, the torture program that implicates uh, the military commissions to this day and has, has really led the commissions to be the failure that they are because they were built around the torture program and to hide them. But I'm interested in, or what I really want to highlight is Guantanamo in a lot of ways has to be seen to be believed. Mm -hmm. um, it's <laughs> really, really difficult to talk about these issues um, and make people understand them, um, particularly when we're talking about due process and how due process has been lost. And you know, to be perfectly honest, I'll, I, I'm always perfectly <laughs> honest, and to be perfectly honest, it's uh, dismaying to hear people say that due process is not a concern when we're talking about one of the biggest criminal cases in US history. But my question is really for Colleen. Um, you know, Colleen has been down as an observer many times to Guantanamo um, at, you know, at the cost of her time and a great deal of effort. And what I, I would love, Colleen, if you would be, if you were able to talk a little bit about what observing the commissions and observing Guantanamo has meant to you and the importance of that. Because it's, it is possible for people to do, it's hard. But I think your observations are, are really, really valuable. Thanks. I think before I went the first time I prepared, um, I was very afraid to see Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, honestly. I was afraid to see his face and to see what he looked like. And um, I prepared by going to meet a woman in federal prison and understand her story and her ideology and how, how she got to where she was. And when I finally did get to Guantanamo and did see the defendants behind the triple pane glass, um, honestly, it, it, it struck me that he's no big deal. You know, he's no big deal. And I, I could feel safe physically because there's a million guards around and it's, it's a very safe place. But I also felt safe because I felt like there was a lot of really smart people working on this huge problem. And both the prosecution teams and the defense teams, and um, it's impressive to sit in court and hear really, really smart people arguing back and forth, and that's what our system is built on, an adversarial system. Um, but then it, then all the weird things start to happen that we've we've mentioned, and the, and you start to think this this can't be right or this can't be true, and 
you know, the the can <laughs> the uh, the judge has a detached retina, so that ends ends a, a hearing, and then there's squabbling over here, and that ends a hearing, and then the translator is from the CIA black site, so that ends a hearing, and then the, it. You're right. You can't you can't really appreciate until you've been there, even if you read the transcripts from home. And um, family members do have the opportunity to watch from closed circuit TV sites, which mm -hmm. which is helpful. That's really helpful because it's another opportunity to see what happens. But physically being there, um, I'm glad you brought this up because I mentioned the the Belgium case. You know, the judge in the in the case in Belgium has already okayed that family members will have internet access to that trial when it happens, and it'll be broadcast also on the radio. So, to your point about classification and secrecy, the vast majority of the American public has no idea what happens down there because it is so separate and far away, and behind behind lots of walls of secrecy. So that would be helpful to have it open up and Thank have more people so see. At considerable expense, we have a number of viewing sites, one in New York, one in DC. And I went to visit to them, and the, when I went, there was no one there. Yeah. If you go down most of the time, we at considerable expense, and there's no one in the audience. And the reason, as you said, because of the overlay of classification problems, whereas in most trials, Theoretically, we'd be able to put it out um, across the internet for access, but um, that will never happen with this process because of the commitment to the fear of certain types of alleged classified information somehow leaking out. And repeatedly, we had leaks in the process. The defense counsel or prosecution, there'd be some leak. And I and again, in a fascinating element of the process, the convening authority is not in control of the cleanup process. It goes to WHS, to, uh, so a different entity, and they make decisions about which computers have to be seized, which computers have to be uh, wiped clean at considerable expense, all because of this commitment to there's something about the requirement for the classification of this process which just undermines the process. And I think what Stuart was alluding to is that he cares about it ending. Yes, due process is extremely significant and important because we're Americans. But as the same token, as Connell said, the building went down. The buildings went down. And the government did a number of things that were a violation of the law of armed conflict. Both those truths are there. Then we had a series of interrogation process that was not pursuant to the rule of law. And we are trying to square these three circles in a way that has resulted in not squaring the circle, just continually having an ongoing process that seems to be uh, never ending because of the problems of the system. And Claire, let me just add something. When we talk about interrogation, it's not just the interrogation, it's the conditions of confinement. Right. It is this uh, process created that is supposed to produce stability, dependency, and dread within the person. So, so, so that is what we're doing. It's not just the interview. It is those conditions year after year that they've been subjected to that we are now trying to keep this uh, cloak of invisibility over. So one of the important topics that we have yet to cover, and why don't we end with this, is that in addition to the difficulties that the history of torture makes for achieving justice uh, in these cases and for having a functioning uh, set of trials and commission system, and in addition to the hurdles that the lack of due process itself presents, uh, there was a strong sense in the working group that the denial of justice and the um, subversion of the rule of law in the commission process and in Guantanamo generally has damaged our national security and our standing with our allies. And that was a theme that the working group kept coming back to. Uh, while the general public may have the perception um, and certain members of Congress like to beat the drum on this, that. Uh, Guantanamo makes us safer. In fact, the national security professionals gathered in this group 
uh, from, from all sides of this issue felt very ardently that, in fact, Guantanamo has not made us safer. It poses a clear and present danger to our national security and to our standing abroad. And I'd just so, like to invite any of the so panel members that, to yeah. speak about yeah, But this. first of all, if there's any questions from the audience, we really would like to enjoy mm -hmm. it. But on Claire's point, again, why this group is so interesting, regardless of the interpretation that some members have of that statement, just as a statement of fact, under um, any ally, ally will not provide us with an individual to be tried um, uh, under our system, render to us an individual. They usually have two conditions. One is a classic condition of that the death penalty should not be imposed. But being Americans, we do have the death penalty, and that's the quote the American way. Uh, but the second condition is anyone rendered to us uh, should not be part of the Guantanamo process. So regardless of how what we may feel, our allies have made it clear they do not see the Guantanamo process as legitimate, and that's a condition they put on for rendition. That is just a fact. The other issue of what this is safe or not, that's a, usually opinion-based, but factually that's a clear statement of the disregard with which our allies are viewing this process. Maybe General Altenberg, yes. you'd like to contribute Final on this word. on this theme, uh, on the theme of national security yes. and and how Guantanamo and the rule of law violations impact our national security, which was a theme that you mentioned in your foreword. Yeah, I'm not sure what else I'd say about that, <laughs> uh, quite frankly, because uh, on the other hand, it's been overplayed by some, you know, who 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 claim that. Uh, this is why uh, the terrorists are still able to organize, you know, uh, mm. when in fact, I think Guantanamo is third of the, th of the three uh, recruiting uh, appeals <laughs> that, uh, that um, um, I, wanna, I don't want to say terrorists, I want to <laughs> say something more than that, but, but, but anyway, uh, and, and that first is the Palestine-Israeli issue, and mm -hmm. second is the, U the U.S. presence in the Middle East mm -hmm. and other countries, our mm -hmm. troop presence, and, and a distant third is with what's happened at Guantanamo. That, that's pretty significant in and of itself, however. <laughs> that's sure a it is. pretty damning statement, yeah. It is. Any more questions, though, before we retire to this extraordinary buffet that I think uh, <laughs> has been put on by Al... Uh, Arliss. I mean, uh, not Arliss, but... Uh, Cyril. Cyril. <laughs> My other organization. Nice try. Yes. <laughs> Any... Oh, there yes. We're <laughs> very happy to have Arliss come. I reckon I... Right, no, no. I sent Arliss the bill now. ABA. I should be ABA. <laughs> Anything else? To, any questions? I, it's, it's rare for the press to be so quiet. <clears throat> Excellent. I guess we've answered their questions. Any final yeah. statements yeah. From, from the panel? Yeah. Mark, yeah, I the, think Mark had one, yeah, one the, more the, the, the one last thing I'd like to say is, as Justice Gorsuch said in the Abu Zubaydah ruling, let's not let shame obscure our vision. Okay, we need to come to grips with the fact that we implemented torture as an instrument of national policy. And until we do, this issue will never be resolved. I think we'd like to end that maybe just uh, as uh, since 9-11 just was yesterday, just a moment of silence in memory of everyone that we lost that day and everyone who worked to try their best to save them. Thank you, Harvey. Appreciate that. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Well, we're so grateful, and we hope to hear from you hereafter. We would love to have you write us uh, uh, and uh, give us your uh, reactions and responses and, and uh, let the discussions continue. Uh, very critical to us that 
this, uh, the issues we raise in this report remain the subject of public discussion, uh, debate, and engagement. So thank you so much for doing your part for that by coming out here today uh, to talk to us about this important issue. Thank you. Thank you.